Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the five o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Tech Talks. We have two austere visitors today, <laughs> and both of these guys have big connections with Japan. So yeah. this is all about. So I have one statement to make you guys. Konnichiwa. 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 Very good. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, uh, can you can you give us a handle, Stephen, on yep. on who um, Alan is and, sure. and how you know him? Okay. Oh, by the way, I should add that you are a professor yes. uh, at uh, the Shidler School of Business, yep. um, and you also are the um, uh, American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. You're with that Chamber of Commerce? Yes, I'm the vice president of the Kansai region, which is the Kobe, Osaka, Kyoto region. Okay. So, so yeah, I'm a professor and dean and a former businessman in tech for over 25 okay. years. So. Wow. How I know Alan, it's actually, if my wife is watching, she, she probably doesn't want me to tell this story, but uh, my wife was a, a student at Berkeley, an MBA student, back in 1988, 99, during the dot-com period. At mm -hmm. that time, students didn't study. They just started their own businesses. So that's what my wife did without telling me and contacted Alan, attempting to get funding. Mm -hmm. So uh, Alan, in his wisdom, decided that the company wasn't worthy of funding. Uh, and I found out about it later, but that's how I actually met Alan. So about 20 years ago now that I've known him. And we've been in touch over the years. We have somewhat a similar background in working for corporate interests and then doing business development in Japan. So Alan, I think, uh, has a remarkable history. He started with Oracle Japan. He was a founder of Oracle Japan in Japan and um, went through the uh, initial period there until the company IPO'd in Japan. And then with the proceeds from that, uh, became a venture capitalist back uh, around during the dot-com period. So he's been in venture capital in Japan and also in the United States as well for over 20 years. He's done remarkable things. And he and I now are working on various investment groups, and we have some projects that we're working on together now. So that's, that's an overview. Yeah. Well, Alan, welcome to the show. Very, Very nice to, meet to you. have you here. Can we shake hands? We have about 10,000 <laughs> questions. Yeah. But well, we're going to do this in half an hour anyway. All right. So, I mean, really interesting that you were um, well-behaved. Uh, yeah, I actually listened. Uh, no, you're well behaved as a child. I'm well behaved. I was in, in well behaved. Utah, you were well behaved. Everybody yes. knows this. Yes. Why do you um, say you were well behaved? <laughs> oh, uh, I've never I, heard this it's story. The, it's, the, it's the first time I've ever heard this question. I never did. Uh, well, I was born in a multi generation Mormon family, uh, went to church every Sunday, believed it through and through, and uh, up and went to Japan for the first time as a missionary for the church in, uh, when I was 19 years old. So grew up, uh, no doubts about uh, the truth of America, the truth of Santa Claus until I was in second grade, <laughs> the truth of the Mormon religion, and I grew up in you know, a very faithful, well-behaved uh, child. Didn't cause any problems for my parents until I wasn't married uh, in my early 30s. <laughs> and mom and dad started to worry a little bit. Lucky breaks, one after the other. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. it started with the church, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I, they send you anywhere. Uh, and I hoped that I might be sent to England, where my mother is from, New Zealand, because I heard so many wonderful stories from missionaries about experiencing Maori culture and Japan, because that's where all my friends were going. And it was in the beginning of the 1980s when Japan was just starting to emerge as an economic power. Uh, and so those were the three places I thought I might like to go, and I was lucky enough to be sent to Japan. Yeah, putting it in perspective, you know, like we hardly had the IBM PC XD going on. No, we didn't. I, <laughs> I, I was fooling around with an Apple II with a cassette tape player, remember, uh, teaching yeah. business school students how to write databases in BASIC <laughs> when I was a freshman. And then when I came back from Japan two years later, the IBM PC had just been rolled out. They had just introduced a 10 megabyte hard disk. And I was working as a programmer. I was so, so excited that I did not have to f flip, uh, swap floppy disks back and forth to compile the software I was working. I could put it all on one 10 megabyte disk, and <laughs> away, days. away I went. Yeah. I bought one. I bought one of those 10 megabytes. It cost me a thousand dollars. That yep. 10 megabyte disk. Yeah. Well, don't get me started on the history of the computer industry. <laughs> we can spend all night. So how did you know? That's, you're really at the beginning. This is at the yeah. inception of the whole thing, and you're in Japan, which is a little behind us yeah. at that time. Yeah. How well, did you get there from Larry Ellison and all that? Well, uh, that's kind of a surprising story. I was I was looking to become a programmer. Uh, I was really interested in computer graphics. So we were just trying to figure out how to represent wood grain and granite and marble with algorithms 
for artificial intelligence. And Steve Jobs had just started Next Computer was talking about, I'm going to create a computer that will let you talk to Albert Einstein or Jesus Christ or anybody in history and feel like you're really talking to them. And so AI or computer graphics were really interesting to me. And Oracle came to interview. My professor said, there's this database company called Oracle, and they were paying a salary about $4,000 more than anybody else. He said, well, the salary's good, I'll listen. The interviewer came in, and the first question he asked me, he looked at my resume, first question says, you speak Japanese? I said, yeah, but how is that, how is that relevant to anything? And he said, well, we, we have people distributing our software in Japan. The, 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 the database doesn't process Japanese characters, and the distributors are anxious to get it done, and we need to hire somebody who can figure out how to do that. that that's really interesting. I can do programming and stay connected to Japan. Uh, and database didn't sound that interesting to me as a, as a category of software, but I went and met all the people that I'd be working with. Really, really sharp. Uh, it was the beginnings of the heyday of Silicon Valley. The, the, the industry was shifting from a Boston, New York-centric computer industry to a Silicon Valley-centric industry in the mid-80s. And I was really, really lucky to what join when, when Oracle time. was about yeah. 400 people. There were a dozen or so of us in the international division. And to work on figuring out how to get the Oracle software to, to process Japanese language was, was an interesting technical challenge. but. From then on, I, I got much more interested in working with customers and figuring out how to build the business for Oracle in Japan. And you did. Yeah, it was, was really, really fortunate, both with our first distributor I worked with, and then later on we hired a CEO out of IBM Japan to take it from $10 million a year to a few hundred million dollars a year and to take it public. Uh, really, really lucky with the people I worked with at Oracle. Well, I, I guess they liked you because they, they put you in their headquarters not too long after, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So I was there in Oracle in Japan from, uh, in Japan from 86 or 87 to 96, and then went back to headquarters to work on some projects with Fujitsu and NEC and Hitachi to get their computers to do, run Oracle better than anything else. And the last, the last project I was working with Fujitsu, I, both myself and Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce.com, see that as the birth of the current generation of cloud computing, software as a service. Oracle in the mid-90s, Larry Ellison decided that there's no reason we should be putting software on CD-ROMs, printing books, sticking it in boxes, putting it on trucks, shipping it out for people to put on computers in their data centers. It's all bits and bytes, and networks are getting faster and faster. We ought to be able to deliver software through the internet, never have a oh. CD, and, and, and we were working world. on this. And we were working on this in 1996 in Oracle, but Oracle sales workers could never get their head around how you sell software without moving expensive boxes. Um, and both Mark Benioff and the founder of NetSuite had to leave Oracle to build this outside of the constraints of the culture, the sales culture that was so dominant in Oracle in the late 90s. And I left Oracle also, and Mark and I both left within a month of each other and coincidentally reconnected a year later and said, well, I'm doing this thing called Salesforce. And I said, I'm doing an incubator in Japan. And he says, I, NTT's come to me about coming into Japan. What do you think I should do? I said, well, why don't, why don't I help you find a CEO and we'll, we'll set up Salesforce Japan for you. So after doing Oracle Japan, I had, again, an incredibly lucky uh, opportunity coming out of the past relationship with Mark that we, I was engaged with the company that really set the, set the game for a new generation of software delivered over the internet. Just as well on one point, um, you know, the numbers, the Arabic numbers are the same mm. in Japan. Right? Yeah, the numbers are the same. And, and the code, the code would be English anyway, right? Right. Um, it's just the interface that has the Japanese characters. Right, so for example, if you wanted to keep a record of all of your customers, Fujitsu, you can spell it in English, but Fujitsu doesn't do that in Japan. They, they have kanji characters for it the names of all the employees, the names of all your customers, uh, any documents that you've written that you might want to pull up in a database. It's all going to be in Japanese uh, kanji characters. Uh, and American computers didn't deal well with kanji back then. And American, there was almost no American software that had figured out how to deal with the Japanese language in 1986. Like a miracle that it was it was it happened. Yeah, yeah so it's a miracle that IBM sold any equipment there. Uh, <laughs> in fact, the, the the person the person that we hired to run Salesforce Japan for us had had invented a customer relationship management software as a category for IBM Japan to prove to headquarters 
they were losing business because they could only do the katakana alphabet, which is used for uh, animal, lang animal sounds, uh, nature sounds, and foreign imported words. That's, that's what that character set is used for. But it was the only thing that IBM computers could print in the 1970s and 19, early 1980s. And the, the fellow who ran partners for us at Oracle Japan and then, and then Salesforce, part of Salesforce Japan for us, he said, we're losing business to NEC and Fujitsu Hitachi because IBM computers can't print kanji characters. And headquarters didn't believe it. Uh, there's got to be all kinds of things you can do with a computer that don't require the use of kanji. And Oracle was saying the same thing to its distributors. There's got to be a lot of applications you can do with a database, a lot of things you can do with a database just using numbers. It's like doing numbers and keeping statistics and processing numbers. Why do you need Japanese language? In it? So there's, there's this debate uh, in the early generation of the software where yeah. I, I, and this you, just you experienced that HP didn't. Of course, it was exactly so the same this, story in HP. I was trying to sell software. Why do you need to put it into Japanese? Why is yeah. localization so important? Yeah. Same battle. So you know, anyway, can you, can you step back for a minute and put yourself in that period of time mm. when these things had not been resolved, not been solved, yeah. uh, where you, you, know, you could see the power of it, you could, you could see, uh, you know, the, 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 it's like a bacterial colony. Mm. It, was getting, it was getting stronger mm. underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. people, it was knitting together. The technology was coming together, and the people were coming together, right? Yeah. Uh, these were the, the best you know, people <clears throat> you could find anywhere were involved in the industry at that time. Yeah. So, <clears throat> could you ever have imagined what would happen? Did you see into the future what would have happened, what was going to happen, what happens now? Did you see that? A few times. A few times I think I actually have. So, for example, being in Oracle in the mid-90s, both Mark Benioff and I saw that Larry was absolutely right, that the industry was going to move, the software delivered over... Oracle and Microsoft both tried to build proprietary networks and compete with the internet as a public service system and own the network. And that, that model where Microsoft or Oracle tried to own the network didn't play out. But the idea that software should be delivered over a network rather than on CDs and physical devices, it was obvious to us, to Mark and I, and not, not, it was not, not obvious to everybody at Oracle. There were a lot of doubters and second guessers at the time. But for Mark and I, that was an obvious truth, that that was, that was the way software should be done. We, we grossly underestimated how hard it would be to get all of the influencers in the industry, the, the companies that, that build their business around selling hardware and software and integrating it and, and taking care of the version upgrades for customers, the whole system integration industry uh, shrinks dramatically when you don't have all that complexity that each customer has to deal with independently. So that, that was one transition that I think we both saw. And, and there was quite a bit of debate in 2000, 2001, whether open source and Linux were going to be the future of computing or whether it was going to be the SAS. And for me, it was clear that although open source took a lot of cost out of the equation, you still had the complexity of individual systems and people having to install and maintain their own computer stacks where with delivery through the internet, all that kind of goes away and you just, whatever you want to do with a computer, you sign up for the Adobe software or you, you get the latest version of Microsoft running in your computer or sometimes running through the internet. Email was all on-premise now and almost nobody uses email that they've installed on their own computers anymore. It's all being managed out of Microsoft or Google servers anymore. Yeah. So that whole transition was, was obviously going to happen. Was much more, it has taken a lot longer than we expected, but that was clearly going to happen. The other thing that I like to brag about was the month that the iPhone was introduced before it had any software on it, just the, the, the incredible innovation of the touch screen, multi-touch screen interface, and being able to zoom in and out a, mo a, a web page and see a full PC or Macintosh style web page on a small device like that, was this also the month that Microsoft Vista rolled out. And I was in my biannual upgrade cycle, my computer has slowed down too much, and rather than cleaning it up, I'm just going to buy a new computer that's with faster CPU, and more memory, move all my stuff onto a new PC. And I was in my PC upgrade cycle at the time this rolled out. And none of the shops in Akihabara, where I would go to buy my computers in Tokyo each time I had an upgrade, none of them would sell a new PC without Vista on it. And I wanted to get Windows 95 because it would run faster and lighter and didn't have all the extra security stuff. And so when Vista rolled out and the latest software from Microsoft made me not want to upgrade my computer, and the iPhone demonstration that ZVEBS has made me desperately want to have an iPhone, 
And it was clear to me that, that it was going to become a platform. They were going to introduce software on it, and it was just a matter of time. It, that, that was faster. I thought. Yeah. But, but that month, I, I was giving a presentation, says, mark my words, this is the month when we will look back in five to ten years and say, Apple took over the leadership of the software industry from Microsoft. And this was still, it was still a time when did, Microsoft was Did you know dominant. at the time? I knew. I knew. Yeah, when, when the, the month that Vista came out, and I didn't want to buy it, and the iPhone came out, and I was desperate to play with it. Yeah. When those two products were announced within a month of each other, I said, this, this is the moment in time. That's when, the piece. When the, when the industry, to recognize the when value. When the industry shifted. Yeah. And that's the context then. I mean, it's hard to imagine. <coughs> but at that time, there were many, many PC journals and you know, experts who were saying the iPhone was going to be a huge failure. Who's going oh, to pay yeah. You remember that? Pay that much money? It for was actually this more thing. negative press on it than positive. The battery life is terrible. So, so I used to joke about they, they call this a smartphone. What's yeah. smart about having to recharge your phone three times a day? <laughs> yeah. Like I have a flip phone, I can charge it once and use it for three or four days. That's a smartphone. Right. So, so to, to my take on your question, Jay, I, one of the startups I worked for in the mid '80s in the Valley was a very preliminary version of networking. I could go into an office. It was like Easy Land, if you mm -hmm. remember that. Mm -hmm. I can go into an office and set up the software and connect uh, the serial ports together. And all of a sudden, the users could share files across the PC or they could use the remote printer. I would go in and that was like magic. People were just blown away that these separate PCs could just so easily be tied together. It was also a very, very cheap product. Novell. That was, Novell. Well, yeah, yeah. that was, was before <laughs> Novell came along. This is when the first iterations of this. It was actually developed by a Stanford AI guy. Mm -hmm. This is a side project of his, and I was working for him. But then, to, to, if I looked, I looked at that, and I thought, this is remarkable. This is software at its best. It's like magic, right? But to where we are today, to be, all of us are now interconnected. We're constantly interconnected. Sometimes I think back to those days, and I go, we, we have progressed beyond a, anywhere where I could have possibly imagined mm -hmm. this technology to take us. The fact that software, yeah. like Andreessen says, is eating the world. It basically is taking over everything, every industry, everybody is affected by tech now. So those were the early days. It was, it was fun and magical to begin with, but I just could not imagine that it would be developed to the point that it is today. And, and yeah, where could, are we going I, forward from here? I though? could never have imagined that that 10 megabyte hard disk in my first app, IBM PC, where I didn't have to swap disks in and out to compile anymore, I could fit 100,000 of them on my fingernail <laughs> and a micro SD I, in, in 30 years. Yeah. Right. So I, looking back on it, you know, you moved. You moved from actually developing these companies, being mm -hmm. inside of these companies. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, 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 with um, with, uh, with Ellison yep. and yep. Benioff and yep. all that. Um, but after a while, you got out of that and you got into venture capital, mm -hmm. and you tried to help other people develop yep. companies. Yep. So looking back on it, would you have done better had you stayed inside? Because <laughs> of, yeah, there, absolutely. Jay, that's a very absolutely. good no, question. It, it, the, the simple answer is yes. At, at, one point, at one point, Mark asked me if I wouldn't uh, leave Sunbridge and take over as chairman of, of uh, Salesforce Japan. We were having some issues with the CEO at one point. I said, yeah, that's pretty cool, but uh, this is like 2003, 2004. I think he'd just gone public in the U.S. And, and I said, but yeah, but Sunbridge is so much more cool because I get to work with all these companies, and I have a big deal in Japan, and Salesforce is just one of my portfolio companies, and, and it's a nice offer. I like you a lot, uh, but we'll figure, we'll figure it out. And looking back now, <laughs> that, 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 was, that was when I didn't call, call right, in, ter in terms of the economic impact. But actually... The reason I started Sunbridge in the first place, in 2000, as many of us did, is like an epical year. So it's the time for epical New Year's resolutions. He says, well, what are my millennium resolutions? And I, a couple times in my life, I've tried to look at about seven years and, and imagine what my life is like in seven years. What's my perfect life seven years from now? And we were still in the middle of the internet bubble. I had done pretty well with my public equities. I bought Amazon a couple of days after it had gone public, avoided some of the overpriced things. and. And I was, I was charting my stuff, and Oracle Japan had just gone public. I said, wow, in seven years, if this trend for the last three or four years keeps up, and we, we believed it was going to. If you remember, in the heady days of the internet, we, we believed this was somehow a, a, a reality. <laughs> it was it should have been, don't you think? It no, I, it, well, well there, were, there were some clear signs. For example, uh, there, I forget the name of the company, but there was a, a healthcare website was basically the only thing it had going for it was that they had licensed the name of the head of the National Health Institutes in the United States as a brand and was burning through $50 million in cash with 5 million net losses and had a $2 billion valuation going public. So anyway, 
So there, there was, yeah, it was, fro- it was frothy. Stock, there were, there was a lot of crazy yeah, w- stuff webpan. happening in '99 and 2000. But um, you know, if this keeps up in seven, seven years, I'll be a billionaire. Uh, but I've already got enough money to take care of my grandchildren without them having to work, or they can become artists or do whatever they want. What's the, what's the point of being a billionaire? Uh, and in that moment, I thought, wouldn't it be so much more cool if I could be involved in creating a thousand millionaires? And and I had had a, I'd had a goal that when I turned thirty five, I wanted to be a millionaire so that I could leave tech and teach debate at my high school, go back and be a high school teacher. So many closet teachers, I yeah, tell you, go find back them all and be, over. A, be a teacher without yeah. having to worry about living wow. on a high school teacher's salary. I said, I want to be a millionaire for that. And this I thought, is well, secondary. So, and so this is this, community service in its yeah, own way. Yeah, yeah. right. And There's so an aspect of that. That, that insight, that if, I, if I have within me the capacity to create a billion dollars worth of net worth, wouldn't it be so much more interesting to see what, how a thousand people's lives change than to, to have that on myself? Uh, but uh, there, are, there are days when I might say, yeah, I really should have taken that, I really should have taken that chairman of, of Salesforce Japan job in 2004 with when the it was stock on the options. table. Yeah. With the stock options. And, and, I, and I would be a billionaire. <laughs> so, so if, Steve, if, if, if Alan had come to you then and asked you yeah. for mm. personal advice on what to do, what would you have told him? Um, well, at that particular time, I would have said you're making a good decision. To yeah, not so Sunbridge was a big thing. In yeah, Japan. I would have at that point, but I agree. Now, looking back at it, he made the wrong decision. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I left HP, and after my mother stopped crying, you know, I, I wanted to get back into the software world. I wanted to be with startups because it was more exciting. But, you know, software, uh, HP has not done as well over the years, but probably financially, I would have done better if I had stayed in HP over all those years. And lots of research indicates that if you're doing well in a corporate setting, probably you're going to do better than if you take the risk of going out. So you know, you're hearing about Alan's successes. You know, there's also the failures mm-hmm. that we've been involved with, and I have as well, maybe half a dozen different startups in the Valley, and none of them really came through. Alan told me recently, he's, I don't know if the number is still correct, 20 uh, angel investments, and you're 0 for 20 at this point? No, no, I've, I've got a couple that you got a couple, so, okay. So, so Watch know. out for angel investments. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah but, yeah, yeah. but I, I, I think, I think I do a lot better choosing, uh, selectively choosing public companies. Well, you like bigger ones. You like the hundred million dollar contract. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I, They're and more I, likely to succeed. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> They've already succeeded. In but, that way. but actually, in a lot of ways, it's a lot more fun working with the early stage startups. It's, uh, you have people who are trying to figure it out, and if you're someone like me who enjoys brainstorming and can make connections and see possibilities. Uh, I, I find that sometimes when I'm, the biggest problem with, make, with me making angel investments is I add a lot of my own ideas on top of what they're telling me. And often when I make an angel investment, I'm investing in my version of their vision rather than theirs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that I find is dangerous. It's fun. It's a lot of the fun of being an investor in early stage companies is you get to have those conversations and sometimes your ideas resonate and they take them and run with them. But if you make an investment decision, Making a decision to invest, including your vision of the, poss- the possible outcomes, that's a mistake. <laughs> so now you know what's what's interesting, and what, what brings you guys together, at least in my view of it, is is the Japan thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Japan was a different kind of market, a different kind of place. It's, I call it uh, intellectual arbitrage. Mm. I mean, what we were doing mm. in the U.S. in Silicon Valley mm-hmm. in, in America yeah. uh, was maybe not not entirely present already in Japan. Yeah. Mm. Japan was behind us. And you were there, you, were, you had experience, you were learning there, you knew the market, you knew the mm-hmm. language, you knew mm-hmm. the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And now you could bring not, not only your own investment with Sunbridge, but you could bring all that know-how, the best practices yeah. uh, from the United States and help Japan in extraordinary ways. Can you talk about it? Well, that, that was a huge part of our, our goal and our vision and our sense of mission when we started was that uh, Japan, the Japanese are very deteriorated, very reliable, very predictable extremely smart and innovative and creative in their own way. And Silicon Valley had a culture of going fast and quick and fixing the mistakes as you go and continue. Silicon Valley actually operated more in a continuous improvement sort of model than Japan did. What did Zuckerberg um, said? Um, go fast and break things? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and the Oracle was infamous for that. We always yeah. were, were right. bothering customers because the software was never quite finished. Right. But we were always introducing new features. And, and Larry famously, uh, in a conversation about the quality of software in Japan, said, 
customers don't buy our software because they want it to work well. They buy it because they know there's something new and cool coming. And they, they want us to keep the innovation pace going quickly and can live with the rough edges. They uh, want new. They want new, they want new and improved, not uh, tried and true. Uh, and Japan is the other way around. So what we were trying to do is, is there some way that we can bring the best of those two processes together, both those cultures together? Uh, when we started doing venture capital in Japan, there was no law, legal framework allowing for stock options. Uh, companies could only be formed, corporations could only be formed with 200 shares priced at $200 per share. Uh, there, was a very, there were very, very specific old rules. And so part of, part of my journey was advising government panels on how does Silicon Valley work? How can we adopt their contracts? How, could, how do we get, we, when, when the legal framework was in place, Japanese VCs didn't use the Silicon Valley style preferred shares. They wanted old fashioned contract and common stock. So it's been a very interesting process over 20 years to see how Japan has taken Silicon Valley uh, processes, uh, put it in their, their own context of uh, companies having a real, real strong sense of mission and longevity and commitment to the community and the employees. Um, and, you know, over the last Ten years or so, the total amount invested has gone from a billion a year, which is where I've been tracking forever, to about four billion dollars in the last year. There are some really interesting companies uh, emerging in Japan that are clearly leaders globally in in their category. Now, not all in some in software, but a lot more in materials, in robotics, in uh, some of the kinds of things that that you might expect. As a venture Japan. capitalist, you get to see all of the new yeah. ideas that come. Yeah. But uh, looking at software, just for a moment, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we only have a minute or two left here. Um, where is Japan going? Because Japan, you know, mm -hmm. is competing with other places now. Mm -hmm. um, and although it may have great, uh, you know, natural human resources and all that, very smart, educated, uh, committed, you know, great mm -hmm. labor force, uh, mm -hmm. world-class labor force. Yeah. But, but the fact is, you got a lot of people in, in China who are also interested mm -hmm. in doing that. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, I'm, I'm not sure of this, but a lot of people in the U.S. too, and it's a global industry now, mm -hmm. and software mm, runs the world. You know that yeah. better than anyone. Yeah. And so, um, where where is Japan going on this? Has a long way to go. Uh, you know, I'm in, in the university environment, and uh, I see that the education processes that are set, even for computer science degrees, are just not state of the art. They're not mm -hmm. producing graduates. Uh, Sun, SoftBank Sun, he, just, he was in the news just a couple days ago saying that Japan is a developing country you know, compared to a third world mm. in terms of AI capability. And if you look at the number of engineers that can do AI in Japan, it's really downranked. It's like number eight or number nine in the world. So because of this um, long-term weakness having to do with software development, and Alan was explaining earlier, um, it's put Japan even further behind as software has become more and more important. So. It's a little bit of a catch-up game right now, but I, we, we think that we can help that. Does that mean opportunities for you? Oh, yeah. yeah there, are, there are a lot of good software companies that are dominant in a particular category domestically uh, who stand up well when foreign companies in the category come in, but uh, the Japanese uh, software community in particular has not yet figured out how to get exposure for, how to hire and manage teams outside of Japan. And there are, there are enough products that have good solid legs in Japan. I think with the right leadership and right support outside, just like when we brought Salesforce in Japan, Concur, Marketo, using that same kind of approach uh, to help a handful of select software companies in, out of Japan uh, be viable in the US and Europe. I think, I think, I think, there are, I think there are some real possibilities. It won't be easy. It never is. Uh, it's not easy for a startup in Silicon Valley to you know, really catch the wave mm. um, because but, but you as want said, your product to be a global product. I, I, Real success is global. So my, success. my ultimate yeah. goal, my little goal with, with, with Sunbridge was prove that there are enough creative people in Japan that you can produce good investment returns as a venture capital here. That was goal number one. Second one, and we, we had done that by 2000, 2004. We were, we were producing investment returns similar to the best funds in Silicon Valley. The second goal, which we have still not Achieved, and no one in Japan has achieved is to show that Japanese tech entrepreneurs, Japanese software entrepreneurs can compete globally with, if not necessarily the best of Silicon Valley, 
there are a lot of there are a lot of companies that are viable, good, solid companies in their categories that come out of Silicon Valley, that come out of Europe, that come out of Australia, that come out of Canada. And there's absolutely no reason why in a category like robotics or factory automation or even, even office software with a really good creative idea, there are a number of companies that you would expect a Salesforce alumni to create in Silicon Valley. There's some really, really good sales and marketing software coming out of Japan. But we're not coming out of Japan, it's being stuck in Japan. Mm. And so the, sec the second goal of helping, mm. helping the, be the better Japanese software startups figure out how to go global is a, is a goal that we've not yet been able to. Well, so the wrong. big question is, you know, you've been on both sides of the, in fact, you've been all over the spectrum as a, as a venture capitalist uh, mm -hmm. and, and dealing in large companies with big prospects. And I, I just wonder where you're tilting in the future. Um, are you going to be tilting more, you think, to software or to these other, um, d you know, developing sciences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, because my expertise is in software and because I, believe, I still believe that it is absolutely possible for a Japanese software company to be viable globally, and I know how to execute on that better than any other industry, my heart is there. Uh, my mind is telling me that there are some other opportunities. If I look a little more broadly, and if I think that my competitors are financial investors who don't understand the details of industry any better than I do, and I have a personal network that I can leverage in Japan, I figure that I ought to also be looking at some of these other companies that are outside of my enterprise software comfort zone, where there's clearly a world-changing technology that uh, I, I'm certainly not at a disadvantage uh, to a financial investor finding these and, and bringing them into the state. So, so I, I am going to be looking at some other types of categories of companies. You know, this may be the most exciting time of all for you, Alan. I think so, yeah. As, as <laughs> I, think, I think it will be. Yeah. So, Stephen, we're out of time. Yeah. Um, but I want to again. offer you the opportunity to, to make sense of this conversation and to summarize what we've learned here today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we've learned that when you get old guys together, talk a lot. they want to talk about their youth. <laughs> the good old days. Yeah. No, I agree, Jay, with your last question. Uh, there is the great thing about being in this industry, and I, I'm so fortunate that I also was able to get into the software industry in the early days, is, is the constant change and the innovation mm -hmm. and the opportunity. And as industries decay, other industries or other uh, developments take their place. It's just wonderful how that occurs. It, but within technology, it happens faster. Mm -hmm. So you can see it uh, happen much, much uh, at a faster pace. So, you know, I'm getting older now myself, but uh, I'm more excited about this opportunity that uh, Alan was just explaining about how helping Japanese companies be successful abroad. I think part of it is we've helped American companies come into Japan for so many years, now decades. And I, I kind of feel an obligation to help mm -hmm. Japanese companies do the same. To yeah, go abroad that, to address the ninety percent of the market that's outside of Japan, because Japan just represents ten percent. So I'm equally excited about this. I, I don't know if that's a summary, Jay, but anyway, that's what I feel at the end of this uh, interview. Well, it's, it's part of a, a profound relationship we have had with Japan over the mm -hmm. years, yeah. yep. and I think it works to our benefit to help them, and you guys are helping them, and that's that's more important than anything, even the money. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. That's Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Great, great to talk to you, Stephen. Great to talk to you.